So last week we talked a little bit about theories and what theories are, and we introduced um, very briefly two different theories we'll be working with in this class, realism and liberalism. Today I'd like to kind of work through what are the core ideas of realist theory. So the core tenets of realism, and this is shared by pretty much all the different variations of realist theory, of which there are a lot, and we'll talk about a few of them, um, really began with the belief that the world is dangerous and brutal. Right? Realists um, live in constant fear that at any moment, you know, riding across the prairie are going to come a marauding horde that is going to pillage and destroy and burn everything to the ground. Um, and if that hasn't been your experience, if you haven't seen that, if you don't live in fear of that, well, you are lucky. Um, that is the natural state of the world. You are not living in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo when the Lord's Resistance Army pours in and burns villages to the ground and slaughters massively. You're not living in Poland during the Nazi invasion. And that experience of brutal, horrible things um, being visited upon people by invading armies is this natural state of the world. And we should be motivated and driven by that reality when we think about international politics. The second tenet that's shared by pretty much all realist theories is that states are really the central actors in this whole story about international politics. Realists are certainly aware that there are other actors out there. They know about NGOs, they know about IGOs, they know about terrorist organizations, but really when realists think about the international system, they're thinking about states. States have armies, states have tremendous power, states control territory, and states are able to mobilize and provide security against those invading marauding armies. And so that's what realists are focused on. Realists also tend to view states as rational actors. They generally think that states are going to engage in actions that are going to be on balance, good for the state. They're doing a cost benefit calculation. Um, that certainly is a, a central idea of, of realist thinking. Um, and that the primary goal of states, what's motivating those rational calculations is that states want to survive. That's the core mission, the core goal of a state and it will do what it has to do to achieve that end. Okay. so. There's a couple different variants of realist theory. One of the variants or one of the, the differences we see in, in realist thought centers on why the world is so incredibly awful and brutal, right? All realists believe that the world is awful and brutal. Um, classical realists, sort of the early stages of realist theory, um, tend to believe that the reason why the world is so awful is because of us. We as human beings are terrible. We're greedy, deceitful, selfish. We're the reason why everything is sort of off kilter and askew. Um, and so the reason why politics and international politics in particular is so bad is because of human nature. And again, this is something that was very um, widely accepted um, earlier when realist theory was in formation, I think drew a little bit from the Christian idea of original sin, that there's just something off about humanity that leads to bad outcomes. Um, more recently, realists have embraced a different way of thinking about why the international system is so bad. We'll call these folks neo-realists. And they say, well, human beings might be bad, but that's not really the core problem here. The problem is that the international system is anarchic. Right, that there's no central authority that's organizing politics, that's solving collective action problems. And as a result, states are sort of struggling to get by and survive in an environment where anything can happen, where bad things can happen, where you can't necessarily trust those around you. And so there's just a pervasive fear that comes from anarchy. And as a result, we sort of get stuck making bad decisions, sort of like in the prisoner's dilemma where that fear maybe motivates you to betray your partner rather than work toward the common collective good, you end up with that sort of suboptimal defect, defect, bad outcome, right? And so the real challenge of, uh, of international politics is trying to manage um, that anarchic system and realists are very pessimistic about whether or not you can actually do that. All right. Another um, dimension of realist thought is how they think about security. Um, realists have, see a, a really close link between power and security. Your security comes from accumulating power, accumulating resources, accumulating tanks and guns and bombs, and the ability to conquer territory, right? primarily military, but also economic power. Um, and the thinking is that the stronger states become in terms of those power scores and those power rankings, sort of like what we talked about last week, the better they're going to be able to ensure security for themselves. In fact, realists would say in the long run, power is the only reliable way to achieve security, that relying upon others or cooperation might work in the short term, but at some point, something bad is gonna happen, things are gonna break down, and then 
you're going to be stuck. Um, because realists are so obsessed with power as the only vehicle to achieve security, and because realists have that dark view of humanity and of, of the international system, um, realists are, uh, really do treasure power. They sort of embrace that idea that power is something you can spend, that if you drop a bomb here, you can't drop a bomb there, right? And so a realist might point to what happened in Libya and Syria, where the NATO coalition um, organized a bombing campaign to drive Gaddafi out of power when his population rose up, but later, when the Syrian people rose up against um, the Assad regime, NATO sort of sat on the sidelines and didn't take an active role. And one of the reasons a realist might point to is the fact that NATO literally ran out of bombs, that France and Britain, which had been on the, the sort of um, leading edge of the bombing campaign in Libya, used up everything that they had in, in terms of munitions, and we're going to have to spend months, if not years, rebuilding their arsenal, right? So the idea is that if you spend a bomb here, you can't use it there. And that's a real concern for realists because what that means is that if you're using power to solve this problem, you better make sure that this problem is a core national security concern. Because if it's not, if it's, if it's something that's tangential to your survival, then you've just wasted those resources and they won't be available when you face another more existential, more survival-based challenge over here. One additional sort of implication of this is that realists tend to focus on relative gains. And I'm going to contrast this with absolute gains, which is something that liberal theory, which we'll talk about um, uh, in, in a future uh, discussion, um, tends to prefer. The difference between absolute and relative gains is, I think, a little bit difficult to get into, but it's actually a really intuitive concept that you've probably encountered before. right? And so the way I would encourage you to think about this is to sort of step, step back and think about grading on a curve. And I'll give you a, a hypothetical scenario. So let's say that there's somebody in the class named John. And John does a really good job, at, you know, watches all the lectures and, you know, engages in the discussion boards and is emailing with, you know, insightful observations and questions, doing really well, but then takes the exam and just botches it. And I'm thinking, oh, John, you know, what are you doing? And against my better judgment, I give John an extra 10 points to kind of get him up over the, into the passing range. But I didn't realize that John has, is a blabbermouth, right? And tells everybody in the class how he got all these points unearned, and all of a sudden everybody else in the class is up in arms and they're saying, oh my gosh, what are you doing, Professor Urlacher? You're, you're, you're so unfair, you're giving John all this fair treatment. And me, in a panic, says, no, 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 I'm not giving John fair treatment. I just mistakenly forgot to give everybody else bonus points. Everybody else gets 20 points, but not John. I don't show favor to John. He just gets his 10. John comes in and says, Professor Erlocker, you gave everybody 20 bonus points. You only gave me 10 bonus points. What's the deal? Why is this? And, and I guess the question I would turn around to you is, should John be upset? And to answer that question, you need to think about absolute versus relative gains. Now, if the class is based on absolute gains, then your grade is a function of the points you accumulate. And so I can say to John in, in full honesty, John, you bombed the test. I gave you 10 extra points, you're 10 points ahead. Sure, everybody else got 20 points, but that doesn't matter to you because you're still 10 points ahead. Your grade is not related to what anyone else is doing. But if we're grading on a curve, then your grade in the class is a function of where you fall relative to everybody else, relative gains. And so John can come in and say, I only got 10 points, everybody else got 20. And as a result, I'm 10 points behind everybody else in the class because of this difference. Right? Even though he got points, in effect, he's falling behind everyone else, and that's what really matters. And so realists tend to think about, um, about power in terms of relative gains. You might be doing okay, but if other states are doing better, in the long run, you're falling behind. You're losing position in the international system, um, and that's what they really tend to focus on. And so you might actually be, prefer a situation where you're actually losing, um, but others are losing more potentially. Whereas with absolute gains, if your economy is growing at 2% and someone else's economy is growing at 4%, it doesn't really matter. You're still growing at 2%. With relative gains, you might prefer a scenario where you're actually in recession and losing 1% of your economy if everybody else is losing 3 Okay, one last element to talk about with realism, and that is that the policy prescriptions that come from realism. So one of the things that we focus on with theories is what do they advise us to do? How would we respond to the international system given what we 
think we know about the international system uh, using this theory. And realists, although they're focused on war and they're focused on security, are not really warmongers. They tend to be very cautious about efforts to change the international system because of their pessimism. You can't really fix things. It's anarchic. It's a, the nature of the system, and that's not going to go away. And so rather than trying to rebuild the international system um, in some sort of new model like um, we'll talk about with liberal theory and the Wilsonian model, realists are pretty skeptical that you're going to be able to do that. They also tend to think about um, efforts to change the international system in terms of potentially wasting resources. Right? And so you're going to want to conserve resources for the things that are absolutely core and important to you as a state. And so realists may actually be quite hesitant in terms of deploying resources. One example I could give you is in the lead up to the 2003 invasion of Iraq, um, most of the leading realists um, in international relations uh, took out a full page ad in the New York Times basically trying to make the case why this was a bad thing for the United States to be doing. And their argument essentially boiled down to Saddam Hussein is largely contained with a minimal use of resources. If the United States invades Iraq, it's gonna be a massive expenditure and you're probably not gonna get a much better outcome. So realists tend to be very cautious about the use of, of resources to uh, solve problems unless those problems are core national security concerns. The second policy prescription of realism is that the ends tend to justify the means. Your goal is long-term survival for your state. And if you have to do things that are perhaps distasteful in the short term, that might be okay, assuming that it serves your long-term interests. And so state uh, realists tend to be less focused on questions of human rights. They tend to be less focused on questions about um, respecting international law. The question is, is this a good move for me to position my country for long-term survival? And if the answer is yes, then they tend not to be squeamish about bad things that might follow from that. Um, that having been said, it's not always clear which policies are good for long-term security. Um, certainly in the um, post-September 11th um, environment, there was a thinking that the survival of the United States meant you know, tearing up the Al-Qaeda organization as quickly as possible, and to do that might have justified the use of torture. However, the political blowback to the United States from using torture against um, Al-Qaeda uh, captives, I think, probably dealt the United States a much more uh, dealt much more damage to the United States and its reputation and standing in the world in the long run than any of the intelligence that was gained through um, enhanced interrogation, waterboarding, or torture. 